Our first speaker this morning, Sri S. Vijay Kumar. Sculpture and Indian temple art are Vijay's passion. He is largely self-taught and started documenting his learning process in Tamil and English on a bilingual blog site, Poetry in Stone, writing extensively on sculpture and art appreciation, targeting early audiences to introduce them to understanding the nuances of temple art. The site has more than 300 posts. The effort continues to be purely non-commercial and supported by volunteers. He and his team of dedicated volunteers aim to document and build an online searchable archive of temple art on the internet. Vijay is a regular speaker and columnist on the Hindu Times of India and other dailies. He also conducts free workshops in schools and colleges to en encourage the next generation to take up interest in our art. Vijay has been instrumental in the tracking of high profile trafficked Indian artifacts for the past 16 years and works closely with various pan-global organizations assisting in their restitution efforts, including the dramatic return of the Vridha Chalam Ardhanari Shri Purathan Nataraja, the Toledo Ganesha, the Ball State Museum Alingana Murti, the Kushan Buddha from the National Gal Gallery of Australia, the Sri Puranthan Uma from ACM Singapore, the Brahma Brahmani from Patan recovered from London. His background work led to the dramatic 20 million raids conducted by Homeland Security USA during the Asia Week in New York City. Apart from a key role in uncovering the antiquities smuggling network of Subhash Kapoor and the US dollar 108 million seizure of 2,622 objects in America. The same are chronicled in his non-fiction book titled The Idol Thief, published by Jagannot Books. Sri S. Vijay Kumar will now speak on bringing our gods home. Yeah. Uh, it's a long day, and the organizers give me 35 minutes with a strict instruction that they go to Prakar five minutes towards the end. So I hope to keep you inside this room for the next 35 minutes. Uh, I dedicate my work to the unknown artists and sculptors who created these magnificent works of art. To the kings and patrons who are important to sustain the livelihood of these sculptors and to common folk like you and me who continue to appreciate these magnificent works of art with the disclaimer that our art was never meant to be art. And i like to dedicate my journey to the immortal works of Kalki. I got into this after reading Pauline Silver, and I never wanted to be a writer, but my book has been translated in five languages. We are working on something bigger out of the book. Hopefully, you will hear about it in the news shortly. The organizers told me that I can let out my inner hulk today. No politicians in the crowd, I hope. So I'm going to start on an auspicious way. I'm not sure how many of you have read my book. I'm not teaching my book. I would like to show you what happened three years after my book was published. Because in my book, it starts the first chapter of what is the concept of Pali Forts. All over India, we get to hear news of idols being coming out of the earth. They're not coming out of the earth. They were put there for a purpose. Our ancestors when faced with a hostile crowd. Buried them for safety. Dagamas prescribed it. But for some reason, they were never brought back to worship. Why would somebody go for such an extent to bury their gods and not bring them out? Of course, the threat lasted for three to five years, in some cases, 60 years, but then the only logical explanation that I could give was that they took it to their graves. Some of them were killed, many of them were killed. In the hope that this will happen. Uh, Vinod, can you play the first video for me? This happened three years after my book was published.
difference is the faith of that devout person who buried it for 600 years to 700 years. This magnificent creation was buried under the earth to be reveal himself as a God, to be brought back for worship. That is the spirit that is being looted, sold with what you're going to see next. Can I have the PowerPoint now? I took it on myself to learn about Chola bronzes. A lot of people ask me, I'm not formally trained, how did you build this capacity? It was a journey of self-learning, visiting about 850 temples around Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Andhra, over a 16-year journey. That today I'm considered the foremost expert, not by the experts, but my, but my team and international law enforcement that they revert to me for help because they know that I have no commercial motives. And why is it important? This is a field no one has taken. I wish academics in this, I know there are a few people here who specialize in it, but I've never seen anybody younger than 70 years who can date bronzes. I hope this forms part of a syllabus. Chola bronzes are considered the high watermark of Indian workmanship. Hardly any curriculum teaches it. And because of that, our gods are being prized. This is a case that was closed in 1978 of Anandamangalam. In 2018, we solved it. These three bronzes were with a dealer in London and this is what happened after that. This is in the Indian High Commission when it was returned back and I can proudly say I was there two weeks ago in the temple and the bronzes have come back to worship after it was stopped in 1978. They have gone back for worship and the local community has embraced it, embraced it to such an extent that Today, the temple receives 12,000 to 15,000 visitors every other week for their festivities. The local community galvanized themselves. They built a strong room. They have CCTVs installed. And at some point, we hope to get back the companion sculpture, the Hanuman, which is still stuck in Singapore. We hear that he is also on the way back. So you'll read about it in the news in the next couple of weeks, I guess. Why is it that our gods are leaving shores? This is a market that nobody knows, nobody studied, nobody documents, nobody polices. Nobody understands the scale and scope of the theft. What you're seeing here is the kind of US dollar numbers that's been thrown at, at our art. We're talking about their own statistics and you can actually see in 10 years the overall art market has doubled. Of course, the main culprits, we, when I say we, Italy, India, Egypt, Cambodia, Nepal are all considered source nations as though we are some mine where they can mine our antiquities and where are they headed? Erstwhile colonial powers, the EU, UK, of course the new power, the US. But something happened, I'm not sure if the slides are clear, but the green worm is Indian antiquities. And you can actually see almost all antiquities took a fall in 2007. And this is the open sale of antiquities. Something changed in 2007. This was satellite imagery captured by the US of Desh occupied territory before after pictures. Desh was doling out antiquity digging licenses and number three of their income was coming from this activity. I'll go into more detail in a while. This is when the US recognized that this was not some random murti that is coming in, something that they didn't care about till 2007. It was linked to organized crime, money laundering, terrorism, and they took a very hard stand. Why? Because it was a Senate committee that was shown these visuals. 
They were shown how much is the average sale of an antiquity and how many guns and grenades and rocket launchers it can translate to. And this hit hard because the proceeds of antiquities trafficking was actually killing their soldiers. This is what was being done on the ground. Each of the holes that you see is actually an illicit dig that was happening in Syria, in Iraq, everywhere. But these antiquities of so many digs were not coming out into the market because the antiquities business, they have deep pockets. They do what is called fencing, meaning they put it in free ports. This is an example of a free port in Switzerland. Italian antiquities worth $20 million were locked in a room for 30 years, never opened, till the Italian police raided it in 2014. Believe it, $20 million locked in a room for 30 years, never opened, linked to a dealer called Robin Shimes. We're talking about entire sacrifice. There are 55 such free ports around the world. What they hold, no records are maintained. Now, 2007, the open sale of antiquities dropped. But you can actually see the private sales boomed up. It's tougher to police it, tougher to even study it. So these are the roots. Most antiquities leave India with underdeclared values. I'm not joking. They were declared as garden furniture, newly made brassware. Uh, Nataraja that was sold to the Australian Museum for $5.6 million was sent out at $600 invoice value. It went to Hong Kong, the buyers inspected it in Hong Kong, and then the money is transferred back to India via Havala. And then they are taken to London, where professional restorers do their work. I'll show you what they do. Now, a lot of people sorry, generally blame our customs. And I work in my capacity building exercises with uh, Europol and and I asked them, our guys, okay, let it go. But you guys let them in as well as garden furniture. So <laughs> it's not that the third world is bad. You are equally bad. So back to the biggest problem that we have is not theft from temples, not theft from museums. It does happen. But what we are losing is buried hoods. These are undocumented. And once they leave Indian shores, they can never be brought back. And because of this, we don't know what great king's history is thrown away because the guy who is digging it is going to look for commercially important objects and not archaeologically significant objects. The moment something is dug out of the ground, he was going to throw away pottery shards, he's going to throw away a lot of archaeologically Reducing an archaeologically significant object to a showpiece curio, context is lost. It can never perform the original role it is meant to be. But then, look at the flip side. If we can incentivize finders, these guys who are finding it are not selling it for the million dollars. They are selling it for the weight. We have documented cases where they paid 4,000 rupees, 5,000 rupees. If the government can incentivize finders, put a finder's fee, we can stop at least 50% of this. And he's just five minutes after the video. He's already back to worship. For 600 years, he's been buried. You can actually see the bridge of the nose, the smile. This is what we need to do. There is a difference between a bronze and a worship and a bronze that is buried. And this is, of course, the great, my great king's bronze in the Tanjore Big Temple. You can actually see what years of continuous worship does to bronze. It almost looks like gold. Unfortunately, thieves think it's made of gold. In fact, I'll show you a case where they thought it was made of gold and what happens. Bronzes do not have any significant quantity of gold or silver. It's only Sastra, they just put a few percentages. Very, very 0.01%. Of course, we are also to blame. This is the condition of our bronzes in a temple. It's, we have failed in our duty. But that doesn't mean that we let them go. The next generation maybe will take better care. We are not in a position to decide, ah, they're better off in an American museum. That's not your job. You are not owners of this. You are only custodians. 
your only sacred duty is to protect it and pass on the heritage. And not all ends up in museums. I promise to show you a video. Uh, it's going to be hard, harder to watch it. So I'm going to play it in the end. I don't want to have a somber mood, but this is a swimming pool where our Koshta Murthis are being displayed in America. This is an active private sales happening in New York in 2017, 2018. This is where our Murthis are being paraded with price tags, people sipping champagne in front of them. Definitely our Murthis, in Tamil we call it Thirumeni. Thirumeni literally translates to body of God. They are taken care of as children by the priests. They would be woken up singing songs, they'll be bathed, they'll be clothed, they'll be fed, they'll, festivals will happen to them. In the night, they'll be sung to and put to sleep. Imagine this ignominy that's happening to our gods. And that's one of the reasons why I called my project India Pride Project, Restoring India's Pride, one artifact at a time. Our bronzes, their only role is to be in the sanctum. The original creators wanted them to adorn their abodes, not the living room of Douglas Larchwood, a British Thai passport holder, his apartment in Thailand. And this is his party. And every nook and corner, you can see our bronzes there. He's been formally charged by the US. He died two, two years ago. His daughter is returning 300 antiquities to Cambodia. India has not had asked for any of these to be back. We all go to museums. Nobody asks the question, why does this Varaha have his leg cut off? Anybody? This is what happened. In Devgar, this is not the same icon, of course. Not really, sir. Actually, if you see, the, it is anchored to a huge pita. That pita weighs four tons. They cannot transport it, so that's why they cut the leg off. To make an immovable antiquity movable, not only that, we have, like your IT sector crowd, transportation. So they break it, we intentionally they cut, and it's reassembled back in America to aid transportation. There are headhunters. This is in Umri, the sun temple, one of the few sun temples, and this is what has happened. Impaled on a stake, sold, and today if you go to New York, this fantastic damsel actually was cut into two. The bottom half was supplied with Subhash Kapoor, and the Met still continues to exhibit it. Collecting, is it a colonial fetish? This is where we want to change the narratives. We're talking about just down this road, you go down, you find a Danish colony. So it's not all British who looted us. Every guy who set foot on this land has been raping our cultural treasures. This Nataraja was part of a 30 bronze hoard that was found by Peter Anker, the then Danish collector. He was digging for his fort. He had a trading license from the Nayaks for two years to build a fort for which the Nayaks gave him permission that we will supply you a limestone and you will pay for it. That was the only license he had. He took these 30 bronzes, the locals cried, the Brahmins cried. He said the bronzes have been buried, they have lost their power, there is no temple nearby that can take these bronzes. Lying through his nose, because if you go to Trankabar and sit on the fort, 550 meters from there is the Tarangambadi Masaramanina, the temple. And when he took it back to Denmark, he sold it to the Prince of Denmark with a note that he bought it from the locals. The original Danish records show or prove that he gave the locals a bag of rice and some betel nuts for 30 bronzes. Another uh, Jesuit priest, Loventhal, collected 80 sculptures from Karnataka, Hoysala and Chalukya sculptures for spectacles. These are currently in Denmark. This is another sad case in Coimbatore. This is from Karivada Parimal temple inside Kota Medu. A buried hoard was found in 1898. The temple bid for it they collected money for 1,000 rupees. They thought they will get it. They were outbid Lord Curzon, the Viceroy of India. Took it back, bequeathed to the VNA. 
some of these bronzes, this is from Kalahasti, possibly the only depiction of Kolothunga Chola portrait bronze, stolen in 1930, never to be seen again. It's been 90 years, nobody has seen. This is his wife, again, nobody has seen. So, <clears throat> what did our police do? And this is actually a report that Indian Italy filed together to the UN when we championed the UN to come up with an international convention in 1970 to, pro to protect illicit antiquities. The best part was the tap is closed world over. But to this day, my estimates, we're losing about 10,000 works of Indian art every decade. Our police had the data. And this is in 1976. You can actually see them list by state the theft from heritage sites. They had data that was going back years and years together. But sadly, now we don't get any of this data. They actually had theft, burglary, everything documented. In fact, they talk about a special Madras report where artifacts from the colony was moved to Pondicherry in 1926 and 1916. So this Pondicherry route, which I discuss in my book, was in existence for 100 years. <clears throat> now, Western museums are doing their own research. This Brahma, this is a research paper by Penn Museum. The Vahana is still left behind in the temple. The Brahma is in the Penn Museum. They published this paper 10 years ago without returning to India. Uh, this is another sculpture by a revolutionary who married an American from Calcutta. She actually <coughs> took this, obtained this from Orissa. And she actually lists on how she did it as well. And it's a documented antiquity. Again, sitting in America and Australia. In the past, we had high-profile restitutions. <coughs> Two's Nataraja are spoken of, the Patur Nataraja and Sevaparam Nataraja. The Patur Nataraja <coughs> case was a buried hoard as well. Caught in London, brilliant case. A lot of people helped, a lot of people took credit. Some of them were not in the limelight. But interestingly, <coughs> metallurgical studies showed that the termite mounds that were there on the base of the Nataraja matched the soil where they were buried. So the termites gave proof. <coughs> Interestingly, the wife, so they wanted to know who can sue. So there were two devis. So they realized that, you know, this guy is dancing everywhere. So this lady must be running behind him. So they picked the one with a slender waist. So she actually sued for her husband in British courts. The British courts ruled that as long as even a single brick of a Hindu temple exists, can be brought back to worship, and the pious intentions of the 9th century noble who donated for this temple has superior rights and gave the Nataraja back to India. Very good, but India did not follow up because this was not destined for London. It was en route to Canada. The buyer was a company called Bumper Development Corporation, a construction company. And in 2013, Bumper Development Corporation donated 80 antiquities to the Calgary Museum with no provenance paperwork. And in 2014, they went bust, and most of their collections were sold in private auctions. If we had woken up in 1972, we could have caught all this. This is another case of Sevapuram. Again, a buried hoard of six bronzes. A Nataraja, uh, two Umas, a Ganesha, a Somaskanda were found. The Nataraja was bought via Bombay, <coughs> but interestingly, the temple gave it to a Stapati to clean. He faked the bronzes in 1956. All six bronzes were faked by a Stapati. They were sold to that time the richest man in the world, Norton Simon, who famously claimed in New York Times that, hell yes, I know it's smuggled, so what? India <coughs> wanted to sue him. In the end, agreed for an out-of-court settlement which said this Brantraja will be in a public U.S. museum for 10 years, after which it will be returned to India without compensation. Everybody is happy, photo event happened, but not much is known that India agreed for a second line in that out-of-court settlement, which allowed Norton Simon to acquisition any object of Indian art for a period of two years, provided it's already outside of India. Norton Simon pushed his stock of 800-odd statues, washing it through this two-year window. And what is interesting is, 
this Nataraja was actually on the cover of the Sentinel volume when the British king and queen visited Chennai, four years after its theft. He had the audacity to print it. Lance Dane was the dealer. He died in Bombay. There was a memorial service for him. But what is interesting is this Omaskanda was photographed and is part of this book is currently in the Norton Simon Museum with a prominence plate reading Sobaram. So in all likelihood, this was what uh, he had uh, basically uh, looked at. If we had gone and checked what else was faked, this is a temple in Kumbhakonam, Sundara Parmal Koil, where the Trimangi Alva has been faked. We found it two years ago, th four years ago. It's currently in Oxford Ashmolean. They have agreed to return it back. It is going to come back soon. Not only that, we are working on many such bronzes. A lot of these have been stolen. We are hoping that it will come back soon. This is another case in London where India and Scotland Yard jointly did an exercise in 1985. We recovered 240 idols in London. In his house, they recovered 41 idols. 281 idols were seized. They are all missing. The case files are missing. There is no records of anybody going to London. Scotland Yard papers are missing. So, yeah, we have this problem. We've been having this problem for a long time. This was a case in Hague. A CBA man visited in 1995. 800 antiquities were seized. Case file missing. So, <clears throat> because of this, we've had this problem where all our antiquities are going, are being sold. So, I'm just going to rush through. Uh, this was something that we worked on. Recovered in Paris. You'll see the news shortly. She's come back. West Bengal, Rajasthan. So every state, this was a six-ton varaha that they yanked it with a truck and broke his legs. Currently in Switzerland, we are trying to bring it back. Sotheby's was actually colluding with a smuggler called Waman Gia. He was arrested in 2003. Said to have sold 10,000 works of Indian art via a host of four Swiss companies. Case closed in 2013 for want of evidence. And interestingly, what happened was this Natesa was actually returned by a UK dealer to the Indian High Commission in 2005. This was the evidence. But it was sitting in the Indian High Commission. No information was given to India until we informed it and it's come back to India. So this is, of course, the villain of my book, Subhash Kapoor. So the two bronzes behind him, along with two more Natarajas, were hidden by his sister after he was arrested by Interpol in New York, still missing, valued at $18.5 million. Nobody knows what happened to them. This Nataraja, they thought it was made of gold. They hacked off his hand, melted it in 2005. The dweller who melted it said there's no gold, and they killed him. So there's a murder case. But this Nataraja with a hand-cut state was sent to Nepal. From Nepal went to London. A London restorer gave it a new hand. It appeared on Subhash Kapoor's catalog in 2007. Before, a month before its arrest, it quietly made a return back to India without any paperwork and was handed over back in an attempt to close the case. So, yeah. This same restorer, Neil Perry Smith, had this sent to him from India. Imagine something of this condition with soil encrustations passing our customs. And this is what he did to it. Clean it up, out for auction. So he was arrested two years ago and extradited to America. His works are documented. So a lot of things are happening. Like Naveen, so earlier people used to come on decade trips. Our own scholars used to take them on decade trips, show them, and they would pick and choose the objects that would sell, and then it was looted, not random theft. But now, thanks to social media, these are all robber photos. They're sending robber photos on social media. You see the two door guardians with the dhoti in the background. You see the balarama with the uh, lungi in the background. These are all robber photos. We've used it, and all of them are back to India. And I'm just going to say, this is my first success. The Adhanarishwara came back. Uh, when uh, Prime Minister uh, got it. Not only that, it created a, a kind of, it was a proverbial tip of the iceberg. A lot of things happened. Archival footage, for example, this is from a uh, site of in, in Chandavaram that was looted three times in 18 months. It was ASI site. We got it back. A lot of things are happening. I'll, I'll just take two more minutes. So, uh, uh, but much of it is in the book, so I'm going to skip this. This is our greatest success so far. 
This Nataraja was sold for 5.6 million dollars. We got it back. And again, before you clap, <laughs> this was how the temple changed itself to receive its God. It's gone back to worship. And uh, similarly, uh, a lot of such stuff is there. Uh, we've had a lot of success in America, in Australia, in Germany. How big was the loot? I'm just going to quickly run through the seizure, the 2,622 objects. It's not just India. It's, uh, we've returned objects to Pakistan. Yes, Pakistan, Buddha Pada. Uh, Sri Lanka, Cambodia, Nepal. A total of 2,622 objects, including this in the seal and an anthropomorphic from not one, many, were found. And this was called Operation Hidden Heidel, valued at $108 million was seized, of which 247 are coming to India now. We hope to pick it up to 1,000 shortly. So a lot of things are happening. Kapoor was in business for 35 years. This was just his holding stock in 14 storage locations in New York. So you can understand the extent of the loot. This was the New York uh, Asia Week raids in 2016. They flew a lawyer to meet me, and that's how I read my book. They said, why are you embarrassing us? We'll give you a blank check. Come and do the work. If you find anything problematic, we will not sell it. I said, I'll do it free, provided you tell me who the supplier is. And if you find a match, you will have to inform law enforcement in seven days or I will do. They went away, no reply. And I sent them a nice thank you note. I said, not everything Indian is for sale. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I hope to give you this good news. This will be the most expensive antiquity returned in the world. A Yakshi, valued at $15.1 million, seized. He's, she's going to come back. This was a theft that we solved, thanks to Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal. Sanjeev was a good friend in Singapore. He was talking about my work to a, a ASA official. This was a theft that happened in uh, Nalanda Site Museum, 1962. Uh, we have a team of volunteers worldwide. And they're sending me stuff that came up for an auction in TEFF. We matched it, and that's actually the right time. It's 3 o'clock in the morning in Singapore. I found a match. Uh, the return happened. And uh, the Buddha is back home. This is the Nataraja that we got back for Pune Nallur, which the Prime Minister is proudly holding now. And we've done a lot more this year. All that you're seeing is just restitutions that happened this year. Uh, this is ongoing work and it's going to continue. We are going to get more. We also mentor other states. Uh, this is Nepal Pride project. This was uh, Narayana, that Lakshmi Narayana that came back from Dallas to Nepal. So all the other countries are taking our lead. We hope more of our gods come home and I'm going to show you two videos please. Just short ones, short ones. This is the actual handover happening to the priest. His father's tenure, this was lost in 1968. The son is receiving it in the court in Kumbhagonam last month. And you actually see how they value the gods. This is the good one. I'm going to show you the bad one. coming. Lots more needs to be done. 
thank you for the organizers for giving us this opportunity. Thank you.